What is going on guys? Joey here and I'm here with Jesus and Russ. Uh, what's up fellas? What's up, what's up? And what's up? Uh, today I just wanted to kind of, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a QA and a at the end, but there's, um, you know, I have the opportunity to work with young lifters and sometimes we run into situations and, you know, got to help those lifters through those situations. But I feel like these two have been there done that they've done um so much in the sport in a relatively short amount of time and i feel that they have a ton of you know experience just from being competitors and being you know have having done it um you know jesus having just competed at you know the biggest stage that we've ever seen and russ is you know probably one of the most accomplished lifters i mean in the usapl right now i think we can objectively say he's probably the he's the most accomplished um, in terms of just like, you know, consistency, national wins, you know, multiple weight classes, like things like that. So he's, he's, these are them guys. So, um, I'm going to kind of paint a picture and then I'm going to pass it over to the boys. And then I'm going to go through some questions that I asked you guys for, um, in the Instagram Q and a, and then we'll just kind of go from there. So the first sort of topic or question that we're going to start off with is, how what advice do you guys have for a young lifter that is going into a competition and they are competing um you know let's say either they have a lot of pressure to perform from their family from their country um, they might be competing against somebody who brings a lot of eyes and they're not used to those eyes um, they might be in a setting that is you know thousands of miles away from home um, there's a lot on the line how do you guys deal with the pressure of competition and, um, you know, w whether it be advice for somebody else or just how do you deal with it? Um, let's start with Russ first um, and then we'll go to Jesus. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's multiple ways to tackle this. I'll start. I'll just maybe tackle two and then maybe we can expand upon that. But uh, for me personally, the way I deal with it is which is probably the harder one, but I lean into pressure. Um, I personally get a lot sharper whenever there's pressure. Um, there's something about knowing that every single training session matters for me. So when I go inside of the gym, I know that this matters. I know that I need to be on point with my mentals every single time I step inside of the gym. So that's a little bit different. And, and I, I've come to realize that's a little bit harder to execute because not everyone's built like that. Um, some people actually do not like pressure. They don't like the expectation. Um, so the advice I'd give to those type of people is just to isolate what the competition for you is supposed to be. Identify what success is supposed to be for yourself. Maybe focusing on the competitor isn't the best thing for your, uh, for your mentals. Just focus on being the best version of you and literally thinking of yourself training in a phone booth. Like the only thing that matters is you and the weight. Um, so maybe if you tackle it like that, it'll be a lot easier for yourself. But me personally, I like to go about it by just accepting that pressure and then allowing it to sharpen um my mentals whenever i'm inside of the gym that was really good i like what you said about making every training session count and i think you know just to piggyback off what you said your training is what got in your execution is what got you to that special moment to that high pressure scenario in the first place so yeah. you know you could continue to do those things and you know continue to win and it should bring even bigger you know, high pressure situations. So your training, I find, especially for myself, you know, I did a video recently about like me just talking to myself before like hitting a big lift. You know, uh, I mean, for me, I'm like, I might be a little bit more, um, there's like two sides of me, it's like the competitor and then there's like the logical like coach side. And the logical side is like, when I get, when I do have those high emotions, it'll say, you did this in training, which means that this is there 100%. And you and you feel great, and your warm ups are great. Therefore, like everything on the checkbook is checked off. There's nothing left for you now than to just actually do it, and you have it. And once I tell myself that, I have the proof because I already did it in the gym, and I, you know what I'm saying. And there's no, there were no variables that that fucked me up coming in. All right? Excuse my profanity. I'm gonna cuss a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, you know. And then once I just like I accept that, I'm like, oh, like that's right. Like I have it. I I've done it. Like I just have to do it again, and then boom, you do it, and you're good to go. So and I'll I, and I'll say one more thing before we pass it to Jesus. Um, for me personally, I think I'm actually my most insecure during during training, like leading up mm. to a meet. Um, I'm very sensitive 
I'm very um, vulnerable, but my effort is reflective of that. I'm working so hard because I'm so insecure and I'm so vulnerable, right? So whenever we get to the actual meet day, I know I've done everything in my power to make sure that I can have the best meet possible. And I'm actually like, I actually let go. I'm actually very free on meet day because I'm like, hey man, it's in, it's in like God's hands or yeah. whoever's hands. Like it's in the power to God's hands, you know? So at that point, like, it's not that I don't experience like insecurities or like I'm overthinking or anything like that. It's just that I get all that out of the way during training. And then once it's time to compete, my mind's pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, on meet day, you're not going to – you can't, like, metabolize more protein. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, synthesize more protein, like, on the, the day. Like, yeah, exactly. Jesus, what you got? I'm not going to lie, man. That question just kind of, like, got me in, like, game time mode. So, like, my, <laughs> my head just started, like, zeroing in. But um, – I, I was going to build off what Russ said, but I think it, what Russell said is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to take a different route. Um, I think to be in a situation where you feel pressure, like I'm sure you guys have heard this a thousand times, pressure is privilege. Because we're in a sport where you're ranked objectively, and if you're not in a position to feel pressure, you're not really in that position to even try to go for the win. So the fact that you're feeling that pressure, you, you, and it's like, I heard this on a podcast before. It's like the difference between excitement and anxiety is your perspective. So I think you like, and it takes a lot of practice. Cause obviously like, uh, like, you know, my background, Joey, like, you know, like the shit that I've been through. So it's like, I've figured out how to flip the switch from feeling that anxiety to feeling more excited, right? And like you, we, we mentioned briefly before you kick, uh, record about how I kind of leveled up um, after like the BS that happened right before Sheffield. So it's like, for me, I had so much pressure going into the me. Like I can name maybe a thousand different things that was going into this me, right? It was, it's legacy, um, all time, like ranking stuff, like, you know, like I had the opportunity to clap back without saying a word, you know, like win for the team, you know, um, but like that, like, and I, and I agree with Russ, you know, it's like you want to be able to like be in your phone booth if you can't handle looking at what everybody else is doing, because like if you can get to a place mentally where you're just so confident in your ability that you can look at somebody else and be like, all right, man, like you're good, but I'm better. Or like you work hard, but I work harder. Like that's where you want to be. Like, I think I was probably the most confident lifter at the entire competition back in March. Like, I, like, you know, I, I was, I, I was definitely kind of felt, fooled. I felt, I felt you and Amanda were very, uh, Amanda was anxious, but she like, she was when the weight is in front of her she locks in but i definitely felt like even when we were traveling i was like yo like jesus is jesus is like he's confident he's so confident and, and what was it what was so impressive to me is like this has never before been done this has never before been done this is this is literally like we didn't know how it's gonna play out let me tell you doing the math at the last deadlifts those little point percentages like the way they had the scoring this time I was fucking stressing the fuck out. Like, that shit was tough. But, I mean, you made it easy. Yeah. I mean, but it just goes back to, like, my confidence came from the body of work I was investing into this competition. Like, like that is literally, like, I slept so good the night before. Like, I was feeling so good the week of traveling because I just knew, like, I had literally just had like the most perfect okay maybe it wasn't perfect like looking back there was a couple of things i could have done better and worked on but i was just so confident in the quality of work that we've put in like those last four or five six weeks that it was just like i knew that like i knew it wasn't going to miss depth i knew my pauses were going to be there and like i just knew like we had been zeroing in on grip for yeah. so long that, like it's just it was going to be there you know, um, and it was easy. And like, that's it, it was, was even hard. Know? So it's like that's something that I always tell people. Like they ask me that. It's like, hey, Sue's like, how do you deal with that? And and I'll tell them it's like, what makes it easy for me to handle is like, I just work so hard in the gym because like how Russ says, 
you have to be able to be insecure because you have to be your own harshest critic. You know, this is like the biggest cliche in like sports, you know, it's like nobody critiqued Kobe harder than Kobe critiqued himself. Like MJ, same thing. Tom Brady, same thing. Um, these guys like didn't need their coach to be on their cheeks because they were already breaking themselves a thousand pieces apart and then rebuilding themselves yeah. every time they watch film. Um, well, real, real quick, like, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, finish, finish, finish. And it's like when you can have that ability to like break yourself down to like a piece and then just build yourself back up and then be confident going into like a me just because you know you did everything you could to the best of your ability like at that point the me is the funnest part mm -hmm. like you have nine lifts like you just got to go out there and do your thing and have fun you know put a show on for the crowd you know like represent because the hours that you spend eating at yourself the hours you spend at the gym just sweating your ass off it's like that's the hard part yeah. and you have to make training a thousand times harder than the meat you know it's like the meat should be exciting it should be fun i think uh another thing too that especially in powerlifting just the way that it's structured it's like we compete i prefer specifically for you two to compete very infrequently obviously jesus we have obligations that we have to meet which i don't like all the time because it's like i mean how many times I've, I've been literally been telling mikey this whole time we need an off season we need an off season we need an off season like we're just fucking do, we just always have to compete um with russ with russ though i don't want him competing like all the time like he could do like once or twice a year and if we could do if we only need one then fine but for a lot of younger lifters you only get like a few chances in the year to like you know, compete and put it out there. So if you fuck up or if you haven't make a mistake or if you're afraid of something and you and it, it manifests in on that meet day, you gotta wait a whole six months before you could make it right. Whereas like in a basketball game, if you have a bad game on a Monday, on Wednesday you can make it right. You could you could try to make it right, right? You could try to make up for it. In football we had to wait the whole fucking week, which I hated. We had a whole that shit the whole week of practice was like I did not shoot this gap the way that I should have, and I'm going to fucking drill the shit out of it, and then when this team tries to run it, I'm going to blow it up. So, you know, it's – it's so I, I could see how a younger lifter, maybe someone who hasn't played sports, that pressure of having – of the distance – um of of the anticipation i mean when i when i was competing i try not to think about it i try to play video games or do something just distract me because if i start thinking about it i'm gonna get fired up i'm gonna waste my adrenaline i feel like you know i just want to save it yeah. for those attack mode moments um russ uh speaking about vulnerability speaking about breaking yourself down <coughs> today you pulled 745 for a double easy as shit and what did mm -hmm. i say what was my feedback i said in the next four weeks yeah. Gotta get yeah, get on kilos. Did that yeah. jab you a little bit? Did it get you a little bit? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, because you were like, oh, no, it's not valid. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, was, I swear I wasn't even thinking about that. Yeah, I, I know. It was I know, just I know. like, yeah. yeah, I was voicing what other people would say. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, that, no. but that's the type of stuff, that's the type of thought process where it's like, yeah, absolutely. That was a great weight, and it probably translates to like what five or ten pounds, maybe less on the Ilico with the fucking kilos. Some people, it's easier to pull on the Ilico. Um, yeah. But but those are the type of things. And as a coach, I have to I have to tell people like I have to be honest with them. Like I had a girl, she just hit a deadlift PR. It was like four fifteen, and immediately and like I have to tell her like I'm really happy that you got that, but I just like that's a deadlift bar. <laughs> you know, we, yeah, we, I think people don't think that now. you hold. Yeah, I think people don't realize that you hold like all of us accountable like if yeah. if i'm not if i'm not hitting like undeniable depth you'll mention you'll be like yo like mm, depth kind of iffy like i'm not sure like you yeah. know may have to like look at this a little bit deeper or like deadlift you're like mm, kind of saw that roll out of your hands a little bit or yeah. just like yo like let's start transitioning back over to kilos like yeah. i think people just yeah. think that you let like your top uh, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely not and actually there's a great question that somebody asked uh kind of in regards to that and I'm really glad that they did because we could talk about it. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, I I would rather you, I would rather the lifter hate me and me be honest with them and them win, and just ha just hate me, I guess, um, than me be, you know, like super complacent or just like make them happy and create this false reality of comfort. That is comfort is a. There's some saying about comfort being the enemy of of fucking greatness or some shit is that yeah, comfort being the enemy of greatness? no 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 no. comfort comfort is the enemy of 
progression or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, because you get complacent. You're not being hypercritical. You're not breaking yourself down. I would have loved to seen the interactions between Phil and Kobe or Phil and Jordan when when Phil was trying to break down break them down and say, yo, like we gotta fix this, gotta fix that. How did he do it? What did he say? Um, you know, there's that clip, that famous clip of Brady and Bill kind of I mean that was that wasn't really Bill breaking him down. That was Brady kind of saying, Yo, if we attack him this way, you know, we could really you know, so I love that stuff. It, it's it's that is the type of stuff that especially at the level that we're competing at you know, it's just it's just crazy high level stuff, and you don't get to this level and stay on top as long as you have. Um, if you don't like you, it, people got to understand. And this is another thing that young lifters I feel struggle with, especially a lot of my girls, is like you do all this work, you put all this pressure on yourself, and let's say you are you are fortunate enough to be a champion. Well, guess what? It doesn't fucking stop because there's there's like. Uh, what's that clip from uh, that mafia movie where the guy's like, he's like, he's like, come here, he's like, you don't fucking understand what it means to be number one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you don't. It's like every time that you compete, you bet everything else that you've done. It's like it's like this tower that you're building and it gets taller and taller and taller and it starts swaying more at the top because it's this huge, you know, this crazy legacy that you built up. When when you've got one win and you get knocked over, it's not that big a deal. But when you have like ten whoever beats you is like famous now you know what i'm saying so and that's why i feel like there's always like a target on us constantly that was really good that was really really good guys i i i should be uh, Weez is gonna see this and be like joey man this should be paid content <laughs> <laughs> um okay so that was really really good i'm gonna go into the q a uh, portion um thank you guys for submitting these questions once again uh yeah, first sure. qu- first question <laughs> I'm sure you guys get this all the time. Um, are you guys are you guys natty? <laughs> no. I Dude, mean, like, 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 I thought it was such a it's such a funny question, and I felt like I could just say what the question is, and maybe we could talk about it a little bit. Like, yeah, Russ and Jesus both compete in drug tested federations. Russ uh, has done IPF. He's also done USAPL, and they find you. At random times, and they yep. test you. I don't yep. think there's a form of drug testing that is more significant than that. Like, I, I mm-hmm. it is the same, you know, similar to what the UFC has. It is, you know, there's USADA, which is like United, like United States, and then you have WADA, which is what the boys get tested under. And that's the world. And I mean, like. I, I don't know how else to say it. Like they get tested constantly. Yeah. There's so many. I've been playing. At one time, I was playing video games with Keiko. It was like fucking what? Like it was like 12 midnight or some shit. 10:30 at night, and he's like, hey "Guys, are at my door right now. Like, I need to go get this drug test." I'm like, "I don't know how." No, else to... at night. Yeah, like 10:30 at night. They yeah. knocked on his door. They could, they they got yeah. Jesse at six in the morning, and he was yeah. pissed. He was pissed. So, was... Yeah. Go so ahead. to add context to what people are listening to right now, like, I don't think. I don't think people realize like we have to fill out athlete or athlete locator forms and it basically tells the testers like where we're going to be at and at what time and they could pull up and test you. Like there is no really getting away with like using drugs really, unless like you're just like some type of like mad scientist because they're going to come and test you in the quote unquote off season when people like think that we would be using. Right. So it's like right now, I mean, maybe not right now because I don't have my time at this time. But, like, when I go to the gym tomorrow, they can test me if they want to. They can really, like, they can pull up and just test me. And they can do it as much as they want to. So, I think people don't really, uh, people don't realize that. And it's, like, the amount of work and stress and, like, I don't even, I wouldn't even know. But, like, to just get away with, like, a clean test every single time. Like, I I genuinely think that we have a relatively super clean yeah. drug testing, or drug tested federation. You could even ask, uh, like, John Hack. Yeah. He'll he'll tell you he'll tell you like that he believes like yeah every, I believe like ninety nine point nine percent of everyone's like gonna be the listening. people the people that are using are the people that aren't on the national stage and shit like that's yeah. the that's the dead yeah. truth most of the people that are on the national stage are people that are competing at worlds like they're probably not using if they're not from Russia yeah I mean Jesus <laughs> tell I mean I'm sure they've yeah, like, I don't, got like, I don't you, think right? I told you Joey but um I think they came and drew blood. MP 
like the week after I squatted a thousand twenty five, and I was right. This is before at, Sheffield. This is before Sheffield. Yeah. Like maybe three weeks out, right? When I would be like on the most, getting ready to mm. go and be at my strongest. Uh, I was literally at my birth, uh, at my nephew's birthday party, like thirty <sighs> minutes away. And they called me, and they were like, hey, if you're not here in 30 minutes, we're going to have to mark you as a negative, and you're oh, going to count as a yeah, fail. Yeah. So I, lo- I literally chugged my beer. <laughs> I looked at my family, and I was like, I'm getting drug tested. I got to go. So I just, like, get in my car, and I just haul ass across town. Honestly, it's it's crazy that you have to deal with that. But, I mean, gu- I mean guys, like, I don't know how else to, like – I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know if people actually believe – believe it or, or if people are just saying that to try to diminish your accomplishments but i will say that if you if you f- took somebody from like 2016 and you put them in a time capsule like they were in the hyperbolic time chamber and they just woke up right now and they saw all the numbers they would think everybody's on because back then like you guys are lifting way more <laughs> than guys that were on shit back then so i can yeah. totally see well, that i, I, I want to say two points joey so um so like russ was right so we have to fill out like these whereabouts right and like let's just say for me uh for ipf you gotta fill it up every three months every quarter if i wanted to go on vacation with my girl somewhere and i forgot to tell them and they show up to my house they're gonna count me as a fail so like you literally have to tell these people where you're going like if i'm going to hawaii the address of the hotel what like and i have to give them at least one hour time slot that i'm guaranteed to be at the hotel it's really in case they're going to drug test me in hawaii and then uh, i know there's a bunch of speculation like i know locally for me like there's a couple of people at this other gym in san antonio and they're like firm believers that i'm like on this new experimental shit <laughs> this is the second point. So, this makes it up, man. So, Wada is constantly adding lit. Like, they yeah. literally refresh their list yearly, and they're always adding new compounds. And, like, that's why they save your piss. If they have, like, your sample, they that test they it save, retroactively, and you can pop you for exactly. that. Exactly. So, like, let's say, like, they, let's just say, hypothetically, I was taking something, like, three years ago, and they barely found out about it. They're going to go back and take my piss from three years ago. And if it tests positive, like, boom, I'm going to fill that. I actually like, remember. Boom. I actually remember Um, it was a couple years ago. It might have been like seven years ago, six years ago. That happened. It happened to a really, really, really big name Olympic weightlifter where WADA got a better test where they could test for more shit. And it was like a bunch of – it was a couple UFC fighters. It was like some power lifters and some weightlifters, and they all got hit because the test had gotten oh. better. And, yeah, Russ yeah. knows. Russ knows. Yeah, and, and it was like, oh, shit, they're getting all these people. And it was it was crazy because, like, they're just, like – I mean, I maybe I'm naive. I'm like, I just trust everybody. I just like, yeah, like, the, you know, like, I assume so everybody's it's, legit. Yeah, so it's like, there's, yeah, there's really – there's really – no way to get around it um and then on top of that it's like like these people don't understand it's like every time a supplement company wants to hit me up like i have to make sure yeah. shit clean. so it's like sometimes i'm even having to turn down a really good deal just because their supplements are fuck they're dirty or they're not third party tested dude I remember one of my biggest fears one of my biggest fears is popping for something that i took so like I, the reason why i stayed with bpm it's one of the big reasons why i've seen peace of mind is that yeah. there's their stuff no their stuff is third party tested so like they they build it in a lab and they send it to a testing facility make sure there's no um there's no like contaminated batches and then they get the product and a lot of companies actually don't do that like You'd be surprised. Like, it's not third party. Hey, just... I mean, I'm not going to say any names, but there's some pretty big lifters that I've had to say, like, ah, I just don't feel comfortable because when they sent me the stuff that they take, I find, like, ah, man, this is, this is yeah, not yeah. okay. Like, this is not something that like, you can do. Do you take. remember, Joey, when we first started working together, I would send you, like, the pre workouts I was I was so paranoid, man. It you gives were, like, me anxiety, dude. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, because. You no, know, I didn't start. I didn't start taking pre-workout at meets until like 2021, I think. Because I'd be so oh, 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 oh. Um, at nationals, I actually think yeah. for us, you didn't have pre-workout. And then 
I asked Weez, and then Weez went to 100, yeah. and then he brought something, and I was, like, freaking out. And then he came to the back, Ke- Kevin, I think, and he was like, bro, mm-hmm. it's clean. Like, trust me. I was like, dog, that was, a per- yeah. that was, like, one of the first times I ever took pre during a meet. I started building and, and, scenarios and, and, like, this is how they get us. <laughs> yeah, and since then, this, and since then, since then, I've been taking it. But literally, like, I would not take it because I'm like, nah, like, I don't need it, like. I'm not trying to get popped Holy for some shit. shit. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, I stress myself so, uh, over that shit so much because it's like uh, another thing that people need to realize is we have too much to lose. There are companies yeah. that like, like you got to be clean. Like if you pay off blood tests, like that's a huge fucking deal. So yeah. Anyway, that was a really fun uh, first question. Um, <laughs> n- next question. Um, how do you overcome a mental block on a PR? Like. I'm sure you guys don't have any fucking problem with this, but they're asking, like, <laughs> they want to take a big weight, but, like, mentally, like, every time they get to that weight, they just, like, fuck it up somehow or they overthink it. So is there any advice that you would have to a young lifter? Uh, has this, maybe you could turn on the coach mind and think that. Yeah, yeah I, I got yeah, this, man. Yeah. So I have two responses for this. For, like, number one, it's, like, we're not. You I'll close my door real quick because my dog's about to run out. habit of. Wait, is it, where's he going somewhere? You get, I, I'm going to yeah, close my door because my dog's oh, yeah, about to run in. Go ahead. Yeah, so you don't want to get into a habit of trying to chase a PR every week, every other week. You don't want to get into a routine of that because it's just bad, bad mojo, bad mojo. But let's just say I've been in the pocket. I've been hitting some really good volume. Weights are starting to feel a little bit easier. Like, let's let's talk about this past Monday, for example. I hit 950 for two, right? Big PR, huge Mm -hmm. PR. And the preparation that led into that decision and me, because like, I like obviously when you go into sessions, you have numbers you'd like to hit, but you always got to have a plan B in case something doesn't feel right, right? Um, It's just like a good example is like, I hit a really good single the week before, I hit a really good set of volume. Um, but I was feeling beat up on Thursday, so I pulled back. I did like 50% for a deload because my back was feeling shot, right? So I deloaded Thursday, Friday. I did some car- some light recovery cardio on Saturday. I rested Sunday. Um, I was My food was good going into the week. And then even then, I wasn't sure if I was going to go for what I wanted until I started warming up. Right. But once you get there, right, so you kind of want to have a set list of criteria before you even allow yourself to think about it. Right. At least that's how I do for myself. Right. I need to I need I have a certain list of things I need to feel for me to even go because it's like I'm at the point where every PR is life threatening. Right. So I, I'm not just going to go for a PR because ah, IG. No, it, it's calculated. It's methodical. <laughs> um. And then you pretty much just clear your mind. You don't want to treat a PR any different than what you would your last warm up, right? Obviously, you're going to be a little bit more emotionally stimulated, but that's where, like, that's where you do your job as an athlete, and you you keep your hands on the steering wheel, right? It's like a, a NASCAR driver. You're going 200 miles an hour. You're adren- or faster than that. You're drilling through the roof, but it's like you stay laser focused. Um, and it's like, you do whatever you want to do to get into that right mindset. You know, like I know Russ, like every time we train together, I get goosebumps because like we just feed off of each other. I'm getting goosebumps right now, but it's like, (laughs) um, (laughs) like you just make sure you do the exact same thing. Like, like make sure your cues are the same. Like don't deviate. That's where people mess up in Mm. any facet, any way. It's like, you try to do too much. You, you like, no, you want to set yourself up to hit a shot you know you can make, you know, or at least it's a 50-50 and you know, like, it's there. You don't ever want to go and try to do something different, you know, like, you stay to what you know, stick to what you're good at, and, like, I think you, most people are going to be fine if they can just do that. Russ, you got anything? Yeah. Or is that good? Yeah, I would say, I'm actually about to make a YouTube video about this um, this weekend, but um, to set yourself up for a PR... Uh, mentally, I think the best thing you could do, honestly, is just repetition and keeping everything the same. So whenever I go into squat sessions or deadlift sessions or bench sessions, um, I have a very formulaic routine. Everything stays the same. Um, 
I treat the forty. I, it sounds so corny, but I literally treat the bar as if it was seven hundred and forty-five pounds. Like I put in that same effort, that same intensity uh, in the bar. So what I mean by that is that when I squat that forty-five, this it looks fat. Like it looks like I'm about to like jump into the fucking stratosphere um, because I'm putting the same effort and energy that I would to uh, into seven forty-five, and I keep putting that same effort and energy motor pattern. Uh, movement pattern all the way up until 7:45. So I'm not even questioning technique. My body's just going. So if I feel like it's there, I'm not thinking about it. I'm just going. Obviously, you're gonna feel stimulated. Um, you're gonna feel that adrenaline rush come in. And I like what uh, Jesus said earlier. He said, um, "There's a fine line between feeling excitement and anxiety. You're literally gonna start feeling anxious, right? So whenever you start feeling tingly, like." I, everyone feels that you have to lean into that feeling. You can't shy away from that and be like, Oh shit, I don't know if I should go. And then like, you're sitting around waiting for that feeling to disappear. You have to realize that's your body telling itself, yo, we're ready to go. Um, if you take your time and, and wait for that feeling to go away, chances are, I mean, that moment's missed and you're probably not going to hit that PR. So don't overthink it. Um, whenever you start feeling uncomfortable, that's the time to go, which is like, it's a scary feeling, but success is on the other side of fear. So yeah. I mean, that's like the, the simplest way I could put it. Tina's being funny. All right. Excellent. Excellent voice. <laughs> Tina's trying to be funny. Um, I got a lot of questions about this. Uh, this one's for Russ. Uh, everybody wants to know when you're going to the IPF. Uh, do I have to break? I mean, uh, we can save that. I think uh, we have we have a plan. That's yeah. all I can say. I want to yeah. keep it under wraps a little bit. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. All right. Uh, next question for Jesus. Um, how, they're asking how strong is your heritage and and your roots. Uh, like obviously you're Mexican, but they're they want to they want to know like are you just like so for example me I'm Italian, but that's like of it like I I have some of the traits of Italians, right? I use my hands a lot. I'm very passionate and loud, and I'm very outgoing sometimes when I want to be kind of. Um, but I'm not. I don't speak it. I don't, you know, I'm not walking around with an Italian flag everywhere. Um, how how deep into your heritage are you? Like, wait, how deep into, like, my culture or, like, how strong is my lineage? Yeah, that, okay, how strong is your lineage? Okay. Um, like, are you, are you, so. like, like, I, I, I had this talk with Keiko and I think I did with you as well before Sheffield and I said, you guys are, like, representing you're representing Mexicans as well. You're not just lifting. You know what I'm saying? I need to. I need to get some shirts because uh, I was at the mall with my mom today, and the, like it happens every damn time. But it's like me and Pablo, we get confused for Islanders because really, you, because it's because like when you look, you got a sleeve. Yeah, when you look at the like stereotypical like Mexican build, you're either tall and lanky. Or short and stocky, but then when you see me and Pablo, it's like You're we're both six feet tall yeah. and we're both wide. Yeah. So it's like that perfect build, right? Yeah. Of like in between, you know, like we have the like the right leverages for good supers. Um, but anyway, so I guess to keep this short, you know, I'm just gonna talk about my brothers, right? So Mo, right? Uh, whenever he was playing football, like he because of the way my dad was. He only got to start playing his junior year. So he only had one year of off season. And he told me that his best squat at 16 years old was he squatted 625 for two. Right? Jesus and that's him at like 6'3, 275. He ran a 4'7. Right. And like that's as far as he got into his lifting career. Right. <laughs> I, I, I think to this day that if Mo would have if Mo would have gone the similar path I did, I think Mo would have been way stronger than me. I think I would have mm -hmm. had my I think I would have had to go work way harder to beat him just because like his frame is way better. and He was just way more explosive. He was probably the most athletic in our family. Right. And then uh, Diego, like you, you got to meet all of my brothers. Yeah. Brother. Diego, the that homies. son of a biscuit eater, literally worked up to seven hundred pounds in less than a year. This dude was going. He got he got laid off, so he started training to kind of let some of that steam off, and then he kind of stuck with training for a little bit. And in like ten months, he managed to go from like five hundred to seven sixteen, and like I don't know. It kind of makes me mad because. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like obviously, like when we started working together, like I was already over seven hundred. 
But I remember like the grind to even get to seven plates, right? And this guy just literally in his like thirty, like early thirties, ten months goes from five hundred to seven sixteen. And then like obviously like the closest to me is Pablo. Pablo when he he started powerlifting maybe two years after I did. So me and you, I think we had already won one nationals. And like we're already kind of beginning to become. Well, Pablo started just started a little bit after you. He's he's only been. So he had to be lifting like, this whole time. He's only been seriously powerlifting for two years, and he's managed to go from five hundred to like eight eighty. Eight eighty, right? So <laughs> it's like, uh, and like all my family, like we're similarly built. Like we're all like Diego's like five ten, Mo's like six three six four, and Hot then a little one. Like, Oh, Carlos is already like six two, six three. Oh three, my man. god, the little brother is the big one. I gotta, I gotta put on my threes to be the same height as him. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But, uh, and then he's, and then he just started posting on his Instagram page, you know. Um, so it's like, and that's just like my brothers and it's like, and if you want to get into like my uncles and stuff, like we're all well built, you know, like mm -hmm. the average height in my family is like six feet tall, and we're all almost all of the males are over 300 pounds or just slightly under 300 Jeez. but we're just big How, dudes you know yeah Shit. i was gonna say um but yes jesus does represent la raza right and <laughs> he's all about family he's he's you know i have i grew up here in los angeles <laughs> it's a very heavily uh, hispanic community and i totally get that vibe from jesus it's all about the family and things like that and yeah, he's very, he's very, uh, y you are proud of your heritage, you could say. And I think, Russ, you, oh, yeah. you as well. Like, yeah. Russ, you're Nigerian, right? And you, I, I know yeah. that, you know, I, I don't know if Russ is like, he, he, Europeans, they walk around, like, they, they're a little bit crazier with it. Like, foreigners are a little bit crazier with their, with their representation. But I'm sure, Russ, like, when you see athletes that are also Nigerian and they're popping off, you have a sense of, um, pride i would say in a good you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah for sure yeah i mean like at, any nigerians that are doing it doing it well um definitely tap in um yeah, yeah it's it's because like people think that i have like great genetics if you look at my brothers like their their structure like my my baby brother like he's starting to work out a little bit more he's like into ufc and he likes doing mma um his physique, like if you if you decided to put on muscle, he'd be way more aesthetic than me. Mm -hmm. But it's just like the genetics, you know. It's just yeah. very small waist, broad shoulders, blue muscle belly. So, nah, bro, I got I got <sighs> to play with some Nigerians football, mm -hmm. and uh, their last name was Nebo. Um, <laughs> but I swear, bro, these dudes had like the best. Like, uh, so the guy that I played with that I graduated in his class, his older brother was like three years older. But this dude, bro, like he he got to play Division One for Tech. Um, actually, you might have maybe run across him. But really? I, forgot, I, for, I think his name was Eugene Nebo. Okay. I don't know, man. He played he played cornerback. But this okay. dude had like the best, like no homo, like the best six pack I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, like, this is after he, like, graduated, like, stopped playing football. And, like, I think he's just, like, a trainer. So he doesn't train as hard anymore. And mm. it's just, like, like you, like, somebody like me, I could cut down 100 pounds and my six-pack would never look like his, you know? Yeah. And it's just, uh, like, it's, it's, uh... Nigerians are crazy, man. They got, they, you guys got some good genetics, bro. Yeah. It's, it's they're... There's all different kinds, and they're they're also smart. Nigerians are very smart. Yeah. Uh, very intelligent. Yeah, some of them. Well, 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 <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> oh man, it's funny you say that because like the whole Nebo family, like I think one of them's a lawyer, the other one's a pharmacist, the middle wait, one's I, a doctor. But wait, the yeah. one that I graduated Did with, did you see that like, clip I, went, like, I posted of um, it was a basketball player, and he was saying that. Like he was like in the process of becoming a, a player, and he and he said his dad came up to him. It and was says, Toby, Look. yeah. <laughs> that's literally like that's that's literally just how Nigerians talk, man. Like my dad, like my dad has a law degree, a doctor, uh, a PhD. He has an MD, JD, and a PhD. Shit. Yeah. So it's like they take. I mean, Nigerians take schooling very seriously. So. Yeah, bro. That's 
that's amazing, bro. I love yeah. that. That's good. That's good. Um, okay, next question here. I guess this one's for me. Who's the easiest to coach on meet day? I'll just keep it easy. They're both like they're totally on the same page, and it's like Joey, whatever you want to put on there. Uh, both of them are usually like, I'll be talking about the plan before the meet. They're like, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. So very fortunate in that regard that they get it. They understand. They trust me, and they know that I want it just as bad. And I'm fucking not gonna fuck up so yeah they're both great they're both great on meet day i will say um regardless of what i feel i always make sure that my execution is gonna get the job done but there have been times like for example that nationals rust where you were hurt coming into it i was not sure what kind of rust we were gonna get so i was very cautious but he was very confident um you know, and I and there have been many times, I'll, I'll, like in Korea, when I called your third deadlift, I called it, and then I ran through it in my head, and I because you know you get time to you get time to change it, and I said the jumps that we took give him the best chance to hit that, and like th that is the that is the that is the number, and it is completely up to Russ now, and I suppose I feel uncomfortable when it's out of my hands, and it's up to you guys to do it. Like, I know, like, I just, I mean, anything can happen, right? Like, we, yeah. you know, anything can happen, but I just, like, it's, like, shit. The third deadlift, when I've made the last call, and there's not really anything for me to do other than watch <laughs> and yell at you, that's when I'm the most, like, I I, I know they're going to execute. I'm going to tell them to execute, but they got to do it. And that's that yeah. little, that little moment of kind of limbo. Um and you got it. You got it. It was it was a sick ass pull. It was crazy. I feel like I feel like um I feel like former athletes like aren't hard to coach because they're no. so I'm 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 so ready to let you do your job. So like I'm yes. not finna overcomplicate it. You know I've, what I'm saying? Uh, I, actually, I feel like I feel like he's used to the same way. Like you're not trying to you're not trying to make his job any harder. You're just it's like, a bro, good like, feeling, right? I mean, there have been times um anytime I've worked with a mentor or anything, it's like I would come in, so like, when I was playing basketball in high school and football, uh, I would go on my lunchtime into the basketball court, like at, at lunch, we would just play, uh, and the, you know, the varsity coach would just be in there, and like, he might have us work on something, and it was always just like, this is when I was in JV, so I didn't know him really yet, but he was like training us for next year, and I'd just be like, whatever he wants us to do, like, I'll fucking do it, like, I, tr I, I wanna, I wanna play varsity, I trust him, he's... He was very, like, they already won a bunch of championships. So, like, anything Coach Bloom wanted to do, I'm going to just do it. Like, it's just, it's a very, like, uh, it's a nice feeling. Even now, like, when I delegate things to others in terms of, like, I don't know, if I go see a physical therapist, if I see a doctor that I trust or a fucking dentist, I don't know. Like, you hire this person to do a job. You trust them, and then you build a relationship with them over time, and then you build that you build more trust with them, and it's almost like I know they're not gonna let me down, so I'm gonna just do what they tell me. Um, it's a, it's a it's a good it's a good like like dynamic between coach and lifter when you have that trust. It's it's a very powerful thing. Um, coming to the next question, uh, for each each of you guys can answer this. Um, I guess we'll go Jesus first. Uh, how did it feel to win your first world title? Um, it was, it was really important because, and I've spoken a lot about this, because going into that first world title is when my mom was the most sick, mm. and it was when her future was the most, uh, questionable, questionable, so... And I think like this this post got like a, it got a good amount of attention, you know, like where on my third squad, like I was just like praying and I was like, Mom, like if you can hear me, like this is for you. Um, so just to be there, you know, like first world title ever, especially after like the drama that happened right beforehand, you know, like we had to like, you know, thank God, like you. Yeah, uh, that Kimberly was so Walker stressful. That was so stressful. You know, man. like shout out to Kim. You know, she's one of the goats and. She's you know, whatever, right? But like that first world title, like um, that one was probably 
my favorite. Well, I mean, I've only had two, but I get the third <laughs> one. But, uh, um, you know, this third one might be my new favorite, you know, because it'll be the three P. But like the first one, for sure, just because we had a piss poor performance at Nationals like three months before. And then the fact that I was able to kind of like turn it around in the short amount of time and I was able to improve in like 18 weeks by like working on grip and just like eating better. Like that was such a, it, it wasn't a total PR, but it was such a feel good moment that we were able to like lock shit down, identify like certain things to improve and then put it into practice. Mm. Well, it was just like it was. It was just such a a good like combination of like story, like behind the scenes, and then training, and then on meet day. So it's like my my first one. Like it's just that's definitely my favorite world title so far. Iris, <laughs> what did it feel like uh, to win your first world title? Uh, it felt. Felt really good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's a little good. bit of story behind that one. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, for me, like people don't know, I lost my first ever world's competition. Like, um, we went to Canada and I got my ass beat uh, by Brett, and um, I just remember like Brett had an all time performance, like, and I just didn't show up. And whenever we were like kind of like having the award ceremony. Um, I was just thinking to myself, like, I had never, it was my first time losing a meet, period. And it just really struck a chord with me. And I remember telling Joey, like, I don't want to feel like this ever again. Um, for the next no, 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 year. You said, you said even, I'm not going to feel like this ever again. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not going to feel like this. Like, I remember that. So I've made a commitment to myself and I just really, like, worked hard for, like, the next year. Um, and, you know, going into the next competition the following year we were able to hit such a big PR on our total that we were actually able to walk away with the, with the championship. So it just felt super surreal, but it was just amazing to kind of walk away with our first one in that type of fashion, just because Brett was like being touted as like the God of powerlifting at that point. Yeah. And it's like, can anyone even beat him? And like, is he the greatest of all time? Da da da. And like, literally we came and like not only beat him, but we topped what he did the previous year as well. So dude, that honestly kind of started, um, my legacy, it, like I, I had won two national titles at that time. Um, but whenever I started doing the world title stuff, it definitely kind of set the um, it set the standard for what we're doing now. To be honest with you, dude, that Brett was such a significant lifter that the the moments in like powerlifting, I'm actually gonna do a little breakdown. I have my uh, my TikTok guy working on something with the original matchup between John and and Gibbs because I think John and Gibbs that first time was like the first time that there was like a big international matchup between like USA and a foreigner, and that helped kind of set this trajectory. And then again, you know, when you did it with the history that was behind it, I think that just sent it to another level. And I think like Brett. It was so prominent, and he was so big in the IPF that to go toe to toe with him, and to even you know to beat him, I mean it was so impactful. And that I'm very thankful. I don't know if other people feel this way about their competitors, but whenever a I go against a competitor that is like that prestigious and has just always competed at that high level, and we and it brings the best out of us. And, you know, whatever happens, like, I'm thankful for that because that's what we, that's, that's, the, those are the moments where you feel like you have these two sides that both want the same thing so fucking bad that they're going to push mm -hmm. so hard and it's going to, you're just going to squeeze, you're going to see a level of competition that I don't think, I don't know if people like realize, listen, world. <laughs> I hope you feel experienced that once in your life. Like it's so, it's so like, like I'm gonna be. I know Jesus feels this too. This might send Jesus out the window. But like, if 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 Ray got healthy and he started blowing up PRs and he started bringing the heat, oh my God, powerlet that would be that everybody would be talking about that, and it would just you would have just like these two titans coming together, and and I feel like. That's what we live to do, and that's those are the moments that, like, 
I mean, like when there's a good ass fight, for example, uh, I'll never forget this: Burns versus Hamza. They both fucking won that fight. They fucking killed each other. Like they destroyed each other. And I was like, dog, dog, give them both. They, I think Dana gave them both money bonuses. Like that shit was, you know, yeah, the judges had to pick one, but like. It was such a brawl. It was such a, a just a display of heart that you can't really walk away from a performance like that and like be like, "Oh, this person lost." Like, no, nah, yeah. that, that's 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 how you elevate the sport. Um, so really, really good stuff there. Um, okay, I don't know. If, you guys could answer this, I suppose. Um, does powerlifting training? affect your physique in a negative way and i feel that there's this perception like i i personally believe that good powerlifting training should be coupled with some bodybuilding elements because you need mm -hmm. to work on the little areas as well and you need to protect yourself from injury and need to help yourself with weaknesses so when people say things like that i assume that they like what do you just squat bench deadlift now if we want to talk about the old school like bands and chains and you're only doing a variation of the comp lift with some sort of thing on it to like make it different yeah i could see that but i mean what do you guys think have you guys noticed any negative things happen to your physique since really committing to powerlifting it is like can, i can answer this so um before we started working together i would have like pretty mild chronic back pain from just squatting like a football player you know um and after like maybe i don't i don't think i started having like really any aches until maybe two-ish years in um but it's like if you're literally j only only squatting benching or deadlifting then i think like let's just say hypothetically speaking you live in a bubble and you just squat you only exit this bubble to squat but just deadlift then yes, I think it's going to affect you negatively. But it's like, realistically, it's like, like people like myself, people like Russ, it's like, we literally have so much stuff that like works as an auxiliary, as an accessory to what we do that it's like, like, no, like we're, I don't, like, I don't think I'm really getting affected negatively. Like my, like my physique, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm literally 400 pounds and I look the way I do. Like you tell me if powerlifting. Hey, you got some shoulders. Me. You got some shoulder motors. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like you tell me, like, this is like, I feel like the best I've ever looked, mm. uh, like mentally, like how I look at myself, like how I feel my girl looks at me. Um, <laughs> 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 Shit. Uh, uh, and it's just like when, you know, like I've been feeling a little bit more confident. You know, it's like I feel confident enough I love to it. like pose and pose and post content like that. You know, trying to exit more of like that content and like deviate from like the typical training post. Um, so it's like no, and then obviously like look at freaking Russ. Like this dude <laughs> looks amazing. Like this guy, like this guy's this guy's a gorgeous man. He's he's, he's <laughs> a beautiful dude. So it's like, like I don't know. That's a that's like a kind of a, a rhetorical question, if you ask me. Right. So, so Russ, what do you I think? think? You think power so, messed you up? Yeah, it's it depends on the perspective that you have with it. Because like, if you're strictly just trying to be like aesthetic, whatever that means, like aesthetic in the sense of like bodybuilding. Um, I've since I've done the bodybuilding side, and like I've talked to bodybuilding coaches, and like I've talked to to competitors. Like that's they don't they don't squat heavy and they don't deadlift heavy because that this is what they say. Their concern is that like it thickens the waist and it creates and it takes away from the element of like the body having that aesthetic look. So they try to stay away from doing a lot of heavy squatting and a lot of um deadlifting. Um so like they'll try to bring up muscles like around those areas to create that illusion of a tinier waist. Um that's pretty much the only thing. And then also uh, I would say that, like, the reason why, like, a lot of bodybuilders and, like, uh, physique people do not do bench squat deadlifts is because the, the chances of getting injured are a lot higher. Um, so they just typically stay away from it. But, I mean, you could, if you're not trying to be a bodybuilder or anything like that, like a high level, like, super quote unquote aesthetic bodybuilder, like, doing squat bench and deadlift is not going to negatively affect your physique. Like, that's just. 
Yeah, yeah I will. There's this uh, the video of Ronnie Coleman squatting 800 for two. I mean, look at his waist. I mean, he's like yeah. a bad example because he's the god, right? But he's yeah. got no waist. He's like no fucking waist yeah. um, because his shoulders are so big. So it's I, – I could see that though. Like uh, me, my obliques, they grow very quickly and like I just yeah. get I have, cocky. I have, a, I have blocky – I have like yeah. a blocky torso like just so I, crazy. Like all the – all the uh, basically – Every squatting and belts and shit. You're training this, and they're, they're training that, and they're not trying to train that because they don't want to. I I know a lot of bodybuilders. They don't train abs at all because they don't want to build anything in the midsection. They don't. Of it. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. They stay away from that, and they and they stay away from anything that's gonna uh, put a heavy load on that. That's gonna force those muscles to kind of like expand and grow. Yeah. So I mean, if you're like Russ said, if you're a super hyper bodybuilder like you got great genetics and you're fucking lean and you want to be like you're going against the best in the world like yeah maybe sebum doesn't fucking but i know i know he squats but see that's the thing everybody's physique is like bodybuilding is like what does your physique need if you just have yeah. no waist then you probably doesn't fucking matter if you train that or not yeah, if, yeah chances are jimmy or little jimmy like just you're fine yeah, <laughs> yeah like, I, think I think he deadlifts heavy every now and then no he does I've seen videos, uh, yeah he, like 675 like seven plates for three or four reps yeah easy too for a bodybuilder yeah. it's crazy yeah um what next question everybody wants to know when are your guys's next meets uh russ you go first uh september so that's gonna be nationals 2023 yep yeah and, and then uh, for me it'll be world and malta in like three and a half weeks Four weeks for you. Four weeks for you. I'll be there in three and a half. I'll be there in three and a half. That's coming it's up. It's crazy, man. Dude, we need a fucking break. <laughs> yeah. Y'all shouldn't do anything oh for my God. Year. Oh, my God. Um, so, there you have it, fellas. Let's see what we got next. Um, okay. I'll do this one, and then I'll probably – I'll do one, one of those deep questions that I, I was talking about, and then that'll probably be it. So, this lifter says – and I could tell the severity of like how serious of a lifter they are by this question, I suppose. They're saying that if they don't power lift year round, they have a FOMO. And it, they're asking if this is like a normal, they're asking if this is a normal thing to feel. Um, like compete? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. They just said powerlifting. So I guess so, like compete and um, like do the, I guess compete. If they don't compete, yeah. You know, a couple times a year, they feel FOMO. Uh, Russ, they're asking if that's a normal thing to feel. What do you feel? About, what do you think about that, Russ? Um, yeah, I feel FOMO like a big for big meets. Like if I'm watching, so I felt FOMO for Sheffield. I felt FOMO mm. for, um, what else did I feel? Uh, I think just Sheffield. But it's yeah. normal to feel FOMO here and there. But if anything, that should just motivate you to train harder. Yeah. Like literally, it should sure. motivate you to go fucking do a meet though. Like, um. <laughs> You need you need to have an off season. Like I don't think like the most important thing for lifters is the off season. If you can, if you keep competing every like every quarter or some shit like that, you're not going to become a better lifter. Like your numbers are going to be relatively the same. You're going to be trying to hit the same numbers you hit in your last meet. Um, I typically like to compete when I know I'm going to be a different lifter. Like I look forward to meet, so I'm like, oh, like I'm definitely not the same lifter that I was last year. So, I mean, you can have all the FOMO you want, but don't act on it and try to compete like frequently. Yeah. Jesus, do you ever get FOMO um, if you're not, you know, in between meets maybe? I mean, like, I, I'm going to just say the exact same thing, Russ. It's like, I, like when I see some of the guys that I pay attention to, like, have big meets, like, like my heart, like, just sets on fire. And I'm just like, God damn, like, I got to go. I can't wait to go train. Like, but it's like, I don't know. Like, I just feel like for certain people. They don't even have these questions because for me, it's like, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this because, and I'm sure Russ is too, because he's been competing a lot longer than I have, but it's like, we've been doing the exact same things on the exact same day, almost on the exact same part of the month, week, whatever, like the monotony of what we're doing for X amount of years. And it's like, I still get so fired up to like go train the next day like it's like yeah. 
Like, man, I cannot tell you how excited I am to go train tomorrow. Like, it's like, I just want to, like, Passion. finish doing my, like, I want to do my work. I want to shower. Like, I want to go, like, talk to Saria for a little bit. And then I just want to go to bed so I can wake up and, like, get ready to go train. So it's like, like, I don't know. Like, either I just feel like either you have that little piece in your brain that allows you to hyper-focus or, like, you, I mean, you can learn to, like, prioritize it like that. But I just feel like like people like me and Russ, it's like we're always going to have an advantage over people who don't want to go train. Because it's like when we don't want to, when we don't feel like training, our discipline carries us through. But when we're like just antsy and chomping at the bits, it's like, it's like you know, like we're going to obviously beat the people who aren't feeling like there's just going to be yeah. no shot. It's like if you yeah. aren't putting that same level of work in, like mentally, like you're just not going to come close. I think people need to understand that too, that you guys are literally competing at the highest level in the world and we have pushed the barrier of what it means to be at that level. Like that level was here and we pushed it even higher. And like, if you don't, Jesus is in the time of prep where it kind of gets grindy. Like you're four weeks out, it's going to get monotonous, it's going to get a little tough and he's fucking fired up to go train. You know what I'm saying? And he just competed, like, not that long ago. I would say that for us, that's th from March to fucking May, June. Like, yeah, that's too, <laughs> that's too fucking fast, right? Um, that's fast. And he's already fired up, like, excited to go do it. If you do not have that, they say, this is a super old fucking quote. Um, Ryan Doris, Russ, used to say this shit all the time. And I know he heard it from someone back, I don't even know who he heard it from, but... If you try to fake passion, you will run into someone who is truly passionate and you will get buried. <laughs> like, like they just have it. Like, Russ just likes being yeah. in the gym to talk shit. Like, it's fun for him. Like, he likes it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's <laughs> something that I don't know how to – like, you just got to have that. Um, fantastic answers, boys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it off with this. Um, okay. I got this from, uh, I don't know if you guys know the Pomp. He's like some Italian dude that talks about money and he has a podcast. And he had this question. I thought it was a pretty solid question. Just something different. Something that might bring out a side that we're not sure of or nobody's seen in you guys. There are three questions, but I think I'm just going to do one because like this shit's already long. Um, question is, which friend from your childhood had the biggest impact on your life and in what way uh i'll give you guys like a couple of seconds to think about that i don't know if you guys had like a best friend when you were younger that really really just like helped you out i definitely did um jesus you go first yeah i mean this might be like an expected response for me but like i'm just gonna say like it, it's my brother you know pablo yeah. to be exact just because like me and pablo like our relationship it's like like, because of where, how he was with my dad, and, like, I was, like, my dad's favorite, and, like, Pablo, like, my dad hated Pablo, hated him, you know? I'm not gonna get into, like, personal details, mm -hmm. but it's, like, he just hated him, and that kind of, like, created, like, this bridge, or not a bridge, but, like, this wall, and it's just, like, I just remember a bunch of stuff from back then, you know? Like, I, I never understood why until maybe, like, two or three years ago. But it's like, like Pablo, like my brothers are really the only friends I've had for the longest duration of time, just because like going to school, you know, like I would struggle with a lot of like self identity issues. You know, I would have like a new best friend every year because I was always trying to fit in. I was always trying to feel accepted and validated. Um, so it's like I never really had any long lasting friendships with anybody outside of my family. So it's like like my brothers are the only dudes that I've been rocking with for 20, 24 plus years. Um, but I will say like just because like me and Pablo, like we were raised like twins. And it's like now like what we're doing together, it's like I'm pretty sure we are the only brothers ever in history to have ever squatted 400 kilos at the same point in time. <laughs> like, like, no disrespect to the stone brothers, you know, but, like, they ain't, they, neither of them are squatting 400 kilos, you know? Yeah. And they ain't natty, you know, respectfully. So it's like what me and my brother respect. are envisioning and, like, what we want to build and represent, like, it's just, you know, like, the fact that we're doing it together after, like, kind of being enemies in our childhood, like, 
like being raised as twins, like kind of like enemies slash frenemies slash brothers, to like traveling together, like going to Myrtle Beach together. Like Pablo has kind of become like my right hand at USAPL meets just because like of the the drama and stuff. So like Pablo has been doing such a phenomenal job. Like he's he's grown so much. I loved having like having back there. To, he was great. Yeah, like he he watches you guys and he takes yeah. notes and he learns. So he's just sponging it up. Yeah. You know, and it's like I think he's getting to that point to where it's like he's really starting to define himself as a very reliable coach and game day handler. Because it's like our the track record that we both have when like I just give him the temps, like he just does such a phenomenal job like taking care of my guys. Like they give me nothing but positive report from Pops like after and it's just like now like where we are now, it's like Pablo's got to be like that one guy for me that it's just, he's, he's, he's influenced me the most for sure. Like from our childhood all the way up until now. Yeah. That's so deep. And there's so many different elements to being the older brother, wanting to protect your younger brother, also teach your younger brother. He, dude, I, I told Chris, you know, he's the only person like that has been through like the shit that we've been through as kids. And that's just the bond that is like, it's very hard to replicate that. Russ, what you got for me? Anyone from your childhood that really left a lasting impression? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my boy Josh, um, he's still around. He actually just got back uh, today. He got his doctorate in uh, physical therapy. But Shout out to um, Josh, man. Yeah. So, like, we push ourselves. We push each other. So, going back to how we know each other, I mean, like, we've known each other since, like, what, seventh grade, I think, maybe sixth grade. Um, and we've always had like this uh, competitive relationship, almost like a think about the the typical anime trope of like a Naruto versus Sasuke mm. or Asta versus Yuno or any of that kind of shit. To where you have like one person that has like a certain type of personality, a little, maybe like a little bit more bright, and then you have another one that's a little bit more like antisocial. But we ha we share this, this the common goal of like wanting to be great at something. Um, so like we've always indirectly pushed each other um and directly push each other our families are intertwined like my mom looks at him as like a brother um and whenever i'm going through anything i mean he's the person i call I, like whether it be about shit with uh powerlifting i'll call him up or he'll have my back and talk shit um he's literally mm -hmm. like whenever me and sean were, were competing against each other he was literally on his ig story saying like fuck sean but like <laughs> all the time shit like I mean, like that's that's just. He's my not even in our me. world, but he's just. He's word. not even in yeah. our world. He doesn't even know who Sean is. I was like, that's that's yeah. like what the funny part is. Like, he has no clue. But I think that everyone needs someone in their corner like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. and he's super invested with what I'm doing. I'm super invested with what he's doing. Like, I'm literally going to be at a graduation party this Saturday. Um, that's just my boy. He's always pushing me to be better, and like he's always like asking me like, "What do I got planned next?" And I think people need people in, the, in their lives like that because, um, it, I mean. This shit can be lonely sometimes, but when you have someone with you yeah. that's able to kind of push you and tap into um, kind of like that energy of like whenever you're younger, it just hits different because you're like, this guy knows me before any of this shit. So like yeah. he he cares about me in a real way. Yeah, yeah. I recently, um, I reconnected with a lot of friends from a past life and it was like we hadn't missed a beat and we did yeah. some traveling together and it's such an amazing thing to have because because your friends that are outside of this they have a perspective of the outside looking in, which can be very helpful sometimes. They also sure. like are successful in their own endeavors. And I think it doesn't matter what you do. Like if you want, if like, if Russ is successful in his thing, Jesus is successful in his thing, I'm successful in my thing. They're success. And this all ha intertwines with powerlifting. They're successful in what they do and it has nothing to do with powerlifting, but, the, but success has traits. Success requires hard work. And, my man Georgie, he played volleyball at, or uh, uh, water polo at a very high level, and that shit is fucking hard. And he has to push himself mentally to places that, like, it's just, it's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievably difficult. And uh, I will say that there is someone who, at a very young age, um, I was friends with. Uh, I, I knew him since sixth grade, and his dad had cancer, and that forced him to harden. And grow in a way that I don't know if people... Uh, the sixth grade is like 13, I believe. 13, 14 years old. And I remember... I'll never forget it to this day. He, This kid, this guy also, he's so smart to the point where... 
I took um, in summer. I took an accelerated. Uh, uh, I think it was economy. No, it was like economy or something with math. I don't statistics. I don't know. It was statistics with the department chair, and we took it in summer. So it was like it was like it's five weeks of death, right? And like everybody in the class got like the highest grade was like a seventy per seventy five percent something like that but he was a hundred always he was this so smart he was the type of person that was so smart that he almost felt like thing like 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 his perception of what reality was was like messed up because of how smart he was he saw things like to the at the ground level like it was so it was so he just felt like everything kind of boils down to people are at the end of the day are just like they just want like pleasure and like the corrupt rich like take over the world and like everything's kind of futile and he would get like down also his dad had cancer so i could understand that but he was a, he was a fucking genius and he anything that he applied himself to whether with that, that involved being smart he would like conquer it and i'll never forget when he told me um and i don't know if like this is something you want to tell everyone but he said hope is a waste of time like the way that he said it, he's like hoping for shit is a waste of time. And when he said that to me, I thought about that. And I think it is important for certain people to have hope because that's what can help keep them, push them forward. But I try to be very empathetic to his situation, understand hoping is a waste of time. Meaning like I take that as if you sit around and wait for shit, you're not going to fucking accomplish anything. You have to you have to make it happen. My football, my high school football coach said you have to fucking take it. You have to grab it. Like if you want it, you got to like relentlessly fight for it as if your life depends on it. And his dad's life literally did depend on it. So hoping, hoping to do something is kind of, you know, I just, it was such a, like, I'm mean, 13 years old. I'm playing fucking Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I'm just learning what they are. I'm just like, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just learning what sports are. And he's like, hope is a waste of time. You have to do it yourself. And I just, when I heard that at such a young age, I just stuck with me and I just never forgot it. And still to this day, you know, like 20 years later, I still, I still remember him saying that. Um, so I think, I think it's a, I think it's a powerful question. And I think, um, you know, that's why when I interact with, when we're in Korea rest, and you got a little 16 year old boy that comes up to you or 19 year old boy and he's so happy to see you and he's like fucking shaking of happiness i'll never forget this moment and he wants you to sign his belt it is the way that we interact with that kid is something that they will probably remember for a really really long time so it's yeah. just i always try to even when i'm in the gym i'm at zoo and i get two 15 year old kids i had a kid who's 14 and 15 year old in the gym like oh joey like you, you put out a TikTok and it made me go to your channel and I listened to one of your videos and da da da. And I was like, I'm so try to be so careful when I communicate with them because I want to just like steer them in the right path. And I think they only get to speak to me in person for this moment. What can I say to them that will maybe positively impact them? And it's just, you, you know, you never know when somebody might say something and you're just going to remember that little moment, that little thing. You know, like this whole, we did like a fucking hour. I know I said it was going to be quick, but I mean, I knew uh, getting a, us three together would probably fucking take a while. Um, no, someone is going to take something from this because they look up to one of us, right? And they're going to, it's going to stick with them. And I think that the impact that uh, us three, right? Russ, obviously you have a big ass following. Jesus is popping off on social also. And obviously like I am who I am. We have a responsibility, I feel, to kind of, I don't know, show, show, what do you think, guys? Do you guys think that we have some sort of, like, there's eyes on us every day. And yeah, I feel like, I, go ahead, Russ. There's a lot of times, yeah, there's just a lot of times where I, I tell people that all the time. Like, you got to be cognizant of what you post. Um, one of the things that my late great coach told me is, like, make sure you're being a productive member of society. Um so like that just means representing yourself well uh, as the, to the best you can of your ability. Um, just trying to be a good person, a good role model. I get a lot of, honestly, I get a lot of parents that come and tell me like, thank you for, thank you for like presenting yourself in a way that I feel comfortable with my children watching and all that kind of stuff. So oh, man. just got to be very, yeah, just got to be very um, cognizant and give out keys when you can. 
Yeah, the parents, mm. like, after meets, when the parents come up to you, I'm just like... Uh, like, when I met Delaney's parents, and when I met your mom and your dad at the opening... Man, I'll never forget that. I might have met your mom before at a meet. I'm not sure. But I remember meeting them, and it's like... I don't want to. I don't want to be shitty because I don't want your parents to think I'm shitty. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's one of those yeah. things that. Um, and I know my mom is looking at me, and I know that you know little Johnny's mom is is like Jesus. We had to call a uh, uh, a father wanted to talk to us uh, before I linked him up with Jesus, and we got him on the phone, and he was just he just wanted to make sure that we didn't push steroids on his kid, and I was like, no, nah, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why does everybody think that? Um, but uh, anyways, guys, this was amazing. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come out on here. I'm so thankful that I have these epic experiences and this journey that we've been on together that I can, you know, just pull from my network and, and put out content like this. Um, but yeah, thank you guys a lot. And um, Russ, I'll see you in like seven weeks. Jesus, I'll see you in like three weeks, three and a half weeks. So yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks guys. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.